Hello everyone. Welcome to today's presentation and thanks for joining me today. So this presentation is going to be a follow-up of an earlier video on periodic orbits or trajectories in billiards and their existence and how we can find them. So if you haven't watched that video, I recommend that you watch it first, but here is a quick summary of what we've seen there. So let us assume that we have a smooth convex curve in the plane and we look at the dynamics of a particle or ray of light in this domain with elastic reflections, which means that let's say it starts here and this angle has to be equal to that one, this angle has to be equal to that one, and this angle here has to be equal to that one. So my picture is not really very precise, but you get the idea. And so let's say we move in a certain direction like this. And here we have an example of an orbit or trajectory of period three. And what we've seen is that one way of describing this is to say that we have a certain parametrization of the boundary, but by a variable s. And let's say we take the arc length along, along the boundary. So we start at s naught with an angle theta naught measured with respect to the tangent vector. And then we arrive at s1. After reflection, we start with an angle theta 1 and so on. And one useful way of describing this is to say that we look at the map that gives me how the s and theta var variables change. And actually it is useful to introduce a variable u, which is minus the cosine of theta. So then our map is the map that goes from sn and un to Sn plus 1, Un plus 1. So this is uh, what is sometimes called the bouncing map. And one useful property, one reason why we use these uh, variables S and U, is that this map is area preserving. And I sketched a proof of that in the previous video. So now what is an orbit of period P. So the orbit is the sequence of these uh, couples S U, while the trajectory is the broken line in physical space. And an orbit of period P is actually a sequence of points starting at some x star such that t to the P of x star is equal to x star. So x star will be a vector s u. And to t to the p here, that is t composed with itself p times. So let us look at a few examples. Here I have the, some trajectories and orbits of a billiard in an ellipse. So on the left half, I have orbits. So I have S on the x-axis, U on the y-axis. In the right half, you see trajectories, which are color-coded in the same way. And there are some prominent orbits here. So there's an orbit of period two that goes through these two points here. And it corresponds to an orbit bouncing back and forth along the minor axis of the ellipse. And there's another orbit of period two bouncing along the major axis. And that appears as actually these two points here. And our aim today will be to understand what happens in the vicinity of such periodic orbits. So here's another example from 
a video I published recently. So it is the billiard in a so-called Rouleau pentagon. So you take a pentagon and then you replace the sides by circular arcs and you can change the radius of these arcs and then you get different dynamics. And so what you see here is an, a case where the, the billiard is quite close to a circle and you see all these examples of different orbits and different colors and many of them look like circles or maybe they are ellipses but there are also some more interesting things going on between them. And another example is a forthcoming video of the billiard in a parabolic resonator. So here I started from a square and I replaced the sides by pieces of parabolas and you can again see some very prominent periodic orbits. So there is one orbit that has actually period two and it is given by, I think it is this one, bouncing back and forth vertically and there's another bouncing back and forth horizontally and that one we see here and here. But there's also a couple of orbits of peri period 4 going like this. And this one you see on the face portrait down here with these four points here and there's uh, another copy in the upper half that just corresponds to the same trajectory but going in the other direction. But there are many other trajectories and orbits here. In particular, you see here in between, there are actually some chaotic trajectories and we will come back to those a little bit later. Now we have to talk a little about, a bit about stability. So there are different notions of stability in mathematics and the one we are going to use today is called Lyapunov stability. And a good example to illustrate it is the pendulum oscillating in a vertical plane. So it has two equilibrium positions, two stationary states, which are the vertical pointing down and the vertical pointing up. And the vertical po pointing down is stable because if we move the pendulum a little bit, it will oscillate back and forth, but not go very far. And if there's friction in the system, it's actually even asymptotically stable, meaning that the amplitude of the oscillation will decrease in time and go to zero. But the upward position is unstable, meaning that if I move my pendulum a little bit away, then it will tend to go away even more. So here are definitions for that in words and also in mathematical formulas. So in words, the stationary state is stable. If uh, so an orbit remains as close as we like if we start close enough. So what it says here is that for all epsilon, which is the distance I am allowing my system to go, I can find a delta, which is the initial distance, so such that if I start at a distance smaller than delta from x star, then there will be a time n, then, no, so, and actually for all times n, I will be at distance smaller than epsilon. It is asymptotically stable if, in addition, if I start close enough, so there's some distance delta naught. If I start at a smaller distance, then xn will converge to x star, so the distance between xn and x star will go to zero. And unstable, well, that's an exercise in logic, so we have to take the negation of the statement for stability, and that basically means that you have to switch quantifiers, so for all becomes there exists, there exists becomes for all, then you have to be a bit careful with uh, the inequalities and so on. So unstable means that there is a positive epsilon such that 
for all positive delta, I can find an initial point x0 at distance smaller than delta from x star and a time n such that the distance between xn and x star will be larger than epsilon. All right, so now how do we apply this in practice? How do we find whether a given orbit is stable or unstable? So let me first recall that, so let me assume that I have a periodic point x star of period p, which means that p to the p of x star is equal to x star. And let me call this map to, p, to the p, let me call it f. Now I want to see what happens when I start not quite on x star, but a little bit uh, away from x star. So I want to see what happens if I start at x star plus y for some y that may be small. So here I'm also going to assume that my map t and f are uh, smooth enough so that I can use Taylor expansions up to uh, so some order and here I will go up to order 2. So then Taylor's formula tells me that f of x star plus y is equal to f of x star plus a linear term. And this linear term is given, let me call this df of x star times y and plus a remainder. Right, so that is Taylor's formula to order two. So uh, what do I know about these different terms? Well, first of all, f of x star, that is equal to x star, because I'm assuming that x star is a point of period p. So it's a fixed point of f. Now this df here of x star, that is what we call the Jacobian matrix of f at x star. And it is a two by two matrix. So if x here stands for su, so I have this map, uh, so that goes from let's say s not u not to uh, s p u p so f of s not u not it is given by s p u p because i have period p so this jacobian matrix is the matrix of partial derivatives so derivative of s p with respect to s naught, derivative of uh, s p with respect to u naught, derivative of u p with respect to s naught and u p u naught. And actually using the chain rule, you can relate this matrix to the Jacobian matrix of the map T itself. So, and finally, what I know about this remainder here. So here I'm going to assume that my map F is twice continuously differentiable and then this remainder will be of order y squared. So it means that the norm of r of y will be smaller than some constant m times the norm of y squared for all y smaller than some delta. So that's the stronger assumption of the remainder Taylor's formula. And one thing I told you before is that my map is actually area preserving. And the fact that it is area preserving implies that the determinant of this matrix, so let me call it A, 
is equal in absolute value to 1. And this is related to the formula of uh, change of variables in an integral and also for linear maps to the definition of the determinant. So you see what happens here is that so if I write uh, xn is x star plus yn my map actually takes the form yn plus 1 or it's actually so yeah so let, let me use n for for the new time for the map iterated p times so I write yn plus 1 instead of yn plus p so yn plus 1 is equal to a times yn plus r of yn. And our aim is now to understand how y changes in the course of time. And what we often do in these cases is to first look at the linearization. So linearization means that we look at the approximate map given by yn plus 1 is I, a times yn, which means that we neglect for the time being uh, the remainder r of yn, but of course we will have to take it into account later on. All right, so let me just write the map again, yn plus 1 is a times yn. So I can easily write the solution of this map. It is given by yn is equal to a to the power n times y naught. Okay, but how do I compute now this a to the power n? So here the idea is that we are going to look for a change of variables. So we are looking for a change of variables. Y is S times Z. And where S is an invertible matrix. So uh, there exists an inverse to have a well-defined change of variables. And you see what happens then is uh, if I plug this in, I will have s times zn plus 1 is equal to a times s times zn. And since my matrix s is invertible, I can multiply on both sides by this inverse. So zn plus 1 is s inverse times a times s times zn. So that gives me a new matrix B. Now, of course, this is true whatever the invertible matrix S is. But now I want to find this matrix in such a way that B is as simple as possible. And what this means is that B should be ideally diagonal or at least triangular. And that is where uh, the notion of eigen vectors and eigenvalues comes in. So let me just recall quickly what that is. So an eigenpair, so assume that I can find a vector v and a number lambda such that a times v is equal to lambda times v. So here v, so that will be a, a vector. So uh, let's say it's of the form su. And it should be different from 0, 0. So that's uh, a non-zero vector. And lambda could be a real number, but actually we are going to allow for complex numbers. So v is called an eigenvector. And lambda is called an eigenvalue. And there's a whole theory about when these eigenvectors, eigenvalues exist, how many they are, and so on. So I'm just going to use the following fact. So if I write my matrix as A, B, C, D, I know that eigenvalues are 
roots, solutions of the so-called characteristic polynomial. So lambda is an eigenvalue if and only if CA, the characteristic polynomial evaluated at lambda, which is the determinant of lambda times identity matrix minus A. So this is the determinant of the matrix lambda minus a minus b minus c lambda minus d if this determinant is equal to zero. Now uh, by definition of the determinant that means that lambda minus a times lambda minus d minus b times c should be equal to zero. And let me expand this even more. That will be useful for us. So that means that lambda square minus a plus d lambda and uh, plus a d minus b c should be zero. And I'm doing that because actually I know that a d minus b c that is the determinant of A, I know that it's equal to 1. So you see that my eigenvalues depend actually only on this A plus D. And let me say that this is 2T. So T is A plus D over 2. Because you see, uh, solving the equation lambda square minus 2T lambda plus 1 equals 0, that is actually, uh, if I apply the formula for the roots of a polynomial like that, that is equivalent to saying that lambda is equal to t plus minus square root of t square minus 1. And depending on whether t square is larger or smaller than 1, I will actually have real or complex values for lambda. Now, what is, uh, why is this useful for us? Well, assume that we, we find two different eigenvalues and corresponding eigenvectors. So uh, a times v1 is lambda 1 v1 and the same for v2 and lambda 2. And let me take the matrix S which is given by v1, v2. By that I mean that the first column of S is v1, the second one is v2. And let me compute A times S. So that will be A, v1, A, v2. But that is by definition of eigenvector eigenvalue, lambda 1, v1, lambda 2, v2. And, well, you can check that this is actually the same as S multiplied by the diagonal matrix lambda 1, 0, 0, lambda 2. So this will be my matrix B, and it's going to be diagonal. So this is how I remember the formula for change of basis for a matrix. Now, it can happen that we don't find two independent eigenvectors, and then it is not possible to uh, put A in, to transform A in diagonal form, but the theory says that it's still possible to make the matrix triangular, say, uh, upper triangular. So, let us now apply this to our situation, and there turns out to be actually four different cases. So the first case is when the eigenvalues are both real and different from 1 or minus 1. So you see the, actually the product of these two eigenvalues, lambda 1 times lambda 2, that has to be equal to 1. So you can check it here or use properties of 
the characteristic polynomial, the product of the eigenvalues is the determinant. So if I have one real eigenvalue uh, which is different from plus minus one, then its inverse will also be an eigenvalue. It, it will be different. And then I can always put my matrix in diagonal form, like here, lambda, zero, zero, one over lambda. So, so that would be my matrix B. And B to the N is simply given by lambda to the N, 0, 0, 1 over lambda to the N. So in other words, if I write my vector Z as, let's, let me say I write it like uh, QP, I will have QN plus 1 equal lambda qn, pn plus 1 is 1 over lambda pn. And what I, I'm saying is that I can solve this and saying that qn is lambda to the n times q0 and pn is 1 over lambda to the n times p0. So what do the orbits look like? Well, that is actually quite easy. So let me plot here my variables q and p. So if, for instance, I start with p equals 0 and q different from 0, and let's say that lambda is the larger eigenvalue, let, let's say lambda is larger than 1, well, p will be will remain equal to zero and q will increase and it will actually increase exponentially. So I will have an orbit that goes like this and it will go to q equals infinity. I have something similar if I start with a negative value of q. Then the other possibility which is interesting is if I start with q equals zero. So then q will remain zero and p will decrease. So my orbit will look something like this. And it will converge to the point zero, zero. And now how about other orbits? Well, you have to observe that qn times pn is equal to q naught times p naught. So actually q times p is constant on an orbit and that is the equation of a hyperbola. So I have a hyperbola like this and an orbit that, that will be that will remain on such a hyperbola. And the same is true in all four quadrants. So this is the situation, and this is called a hyperbolic point because of these hyperbolas. And it is unstable because we've seen that, for instance, if we start with a non-zero q and p equal zero, we will go to infinity. That was the first case. The second case is the case where actually my eigenvalues are complex. And they have to be complex conjugate, so I can write them as exponential plus minus i theta. And I want theta to be uh, not to be a multiple of pi, because then again I get uh, the cases 1 and minus 1. Well, in that case, you can actually write your matrix B in complex form with complex exponentials like this. But you can also write it in uh, real form with sines and cosines. And this is now uh, a matrix describing a rotation by the angle theta. So what this now means is that I have my coordinate system here. And my orbits will actually belong to circles. So something like, like this. So uh, an orbit will be a set of points here. 
where the angle here is always theta. And as we've seen in the previous video, depending on whether theta over 2 pi is rational or irrational, we will have something periodic or we will have something dense on the circle. But in both cases we have rotations. So this type of point is called elliptic because when I transform back to my y coordinates from the z coordinates, actually the circles can become ellipses. But you see that these points are stable because, well, whether I'm on a circle or on an ellipse, I will all, always remain at bounded distance from my uh, stationary point. So that was case number two. Now case number three, that is when the eigenvalues are both equal either to one or to minus one. And okay, so they have to be equal in that case. And now it may occur that the matrix is, can be made diagonal. So I have two independent eigenvectors and then it will be the identity matrix or minus the identity matrix. And that is a very simple case because it means that if I have the identity matrix, my map just doesn't do anything. I, wherever I start, I remain at the same point. And if there's a minus sign, it just means that I move back and forth between two points. And in any case, this is a stable situation and it's called a parabolic point. And the last possibility is the one where, again, I have two equal eigenvalues, equal both to one or both to minus one, but I ca cannot find two independent eigenvectors. And then what I can achieve is to get the so-called Jordan canonical form, which is a triangular matrix. And in that case, what happens is that you see, I will have a map of the form Qn plus 1 is Qn plus Pn, and Pn plus 1 is Pn. And we have actually seen uh, such an example in the previous video. It appears in the case where I have a billiard in a circle. So what happens here is that my orbits will they will stay on horizontal lines, but depending on where I start, I will move to the right or to the left and uh, at uh, different speeds, depending on the height. Maybe like this and maybe like this. So such a point is again called parabolic, but it is unstable. So there are two subcases for parabolic points. So here we have seen the four possible cases for a uh, so, uh, periodic orbit or a uh, fixed point of f, which is t to the p, when we just look at the linearization. Now, the question that we have to ask now is what happens when we take nonlinear terms into account? So remember my map at the form yn plus 1 is equal to a times yn plus r of yn. And this r satisfied, so its norm was smaller than a constant times the norm of r, y squared, at least when y is not too large. So y is smaller than some delta. So we have understood what happens in the linear case, but what happens now in the nonlinear case? So this turns out to be actually quite a difficult question in general. Now let me mention one result which is actually not going to be very useful for us, but it is useful in other situations. So it's the following theorem, which is due to Lyapunov. 
and it says that if all eigenvalues of a have a, so they can be real or complex, but if they have a real part, uh, no, sorry, if they have a modulo strictly smaller than one, Then, so here it is my point uh, zero, but it would, would be x star. The general case is actually asymptotically stable. So this is not useful for us because uh, since our maps are area preserving, they, uh, there always has to be one eigenvalue which is larger or equal to one in modulus. But since this is a useful result, let me just sketch the proof in a particular case. So let me assume that I have two eigenvalues, lambda one, lambda two, which are real. And le okay, let me just say that they are real and positive and they are both smaller than one. So the idea is that my map now has the form qn plus one is lambda one qn plus, so there's my first part of the remainder, r1 of qn pn, and pn plus one is lambda two pn plus r2 of qn pn. And the idea of Lyapunov was to take a function v of qp, which in this case I can take equal to uh, q squared plus p squared. So it's just the distance to uh, my point squared. And to try to show that v of qn plus one, pn plus one, will be smaller than v of qn pn. So in other words, I have a contraction. And this is true because you see, if I, I have to expand these squares, so I, I get something like lambda one squared qn squared plus lambda two squared pn squared plus other terms, which are the cross terms and r1 squared, r2 squared. But these terms are of higher order. Okay, so what is the order? Well, they will be of order. So if y is my vector qp, they will have order y to uh, the power three. And the point is that this is smaller than, I've assumed that lambda one is smaller, it can be equal actually lambda two, so that will be smaller than lambda two squared times qn squared plus pn squared, but which is v of qn pn. Okay, and the terms of higher order, they will be smaller than actually v of some constant v of qn pn to the power three over two. And so what you see is that v of qn plus one pn plus one is smaller than v of qn pn times lambda two squared plus c times v of qn pn to the power one half. And since lambda two is smaller than one, well, if qn and pn are small enough, this v to the one half term will be small. So 
all this will be strictly smaller than 1 if qn, pn are small enough. So it means that v will decrease and it will keep decreasing and so it will go to zero and that means that my point is asymptotically stable. All right, but now uh, what happens in our cases? So I will discuss briefly the two main cases which are hyperbolic and elliptic orbits. So in the hyperbolic case the most important result is called the stable manifold theorem. It, it says the following. It says that there exist invariant curves, curves when I'm in 2D, in a higher dimension it would be manifolds, maybe surfaces, that are tangent to the linear stable and unstable spaces of a hyperbolic point. And these curves exist globally and therefore hyperbolic orbits are unstable, even in the nonlinear case. So what do I mean by that? So let me first look at the linear case. So that would be the linear case. And remember I explained that the orbits uh, belong to hyperbolas. So there's this axis here which is unstable, this axis here which is stable, and then my orbits belong to uh, hyperbolas like this. So like, like this and like this and so on. So, so here the, the axes, are, these are the uh, linear stable and unstable spaces. So this is the unstable one here and this is the, the stable one here. Now what this theorem says is that in the nonlinear case I will have a situation like this. So I will still have invariant curves. So I will have something, maybe they look like this. So that will be my unstable manifold. And it is tangent to the uh, unstable uh, linear space at my, uh, my uh, fixed point of F here. And I will also have something like this. So here I will have a stable manifold, which is tangent to the linear stable space. So this here applies to the nonlinear case. And in general orbits will do something like that. So of course orbits are just collections of points on these curves. And so this means that uh, my point will still be unstable because I can start on the unstable manifold and I will go at least some dis distance away from the fixed point. And the result also says that these curves exist globally, which means that, okay, locally they have a nice form uh, of, of a graph like this, but actually I can just keep following these curves and, and they will exist. They may be complicated, but they exist. Now, Regarding this complicated uh, thing, that is uh, actually one of the possible mechanisms for chaos. So let me assume that I have now two hyperbolic points like this. So here's one, I plot the unstable and stable manifolds and I have another one here. So unstable manifold, stable manifold. So uh, 
What can happen, and that is actually what happens for the ellipse, is that the unstable, so the nonlinear unstable manifold of one point joins the stable manifold of the other one. So that can happen. However, that is a rather exceptional situation, so what happens in general is more something like this. So I have the unstable manifold here, I have the stable manifold of the other point, and they actu actually, they're not identical, but they're cross at, at some point, let's say x here. Now, what uh, does it mean? You have to see that x is on the stable manifold of the right-hand point. So I will have f of x here, and then f squared of x here, and, and so on. And actually, the images of this point will converge to the right-hand hyperbolic point. But I also have the same in negative times, so the the pre-image of x, so f inverse of x, will be on the unstable manifold of the left-hand hyperbolic point, and so on. So I have a whole negative time orbit going like this. But you see these two uh, hyperbolic, I mean these two manifolds exist and since they cross at point x, they also have to cross at point f of x and f square of x. And so actually what happens is that if my map is orientation preserving, I will probably have something that looks a bit like that. Right, so, so the, the unstable manifold of the left point will do that. But then it also has, they have to cross again at f square of x, and because my map is area preserving, the area of this part here is equal to the area of this part here. And this keeps happening, but you see that the points here get closer and closer, so I will have a very complicated picture like that with lots of oscillations. And the same happens uh, also in backward time. And because of area preservation, in general, also these oscillating manifolds will intersect again. And since all the images of these points have to intersect, well, that makes a lot of intersections and actually a very complicated dynamics. So this is called a heteroclinic tangle. If the two hyperbolic points are different, I can also have something like that when I have the unstable manifold of a hyperbolic point that intersects its own stable manifold. That is called a homoclinic tangle. And this mechanism was already discovered by Henri Poincaré at the beginning of the 20th century, and he wrote something like, okay, the picture is so complicated that I don't really uh, try to draw it. However, later on in the 1960s, people like Stephen Smale have used this idea to, uh, to go further, and Smale introduced the so-called Smale horseshoe map, which really allows to show that there are chaotic orbits. And maybe I will talk about that in another video. But now let us move to elliptic orbits. So we have seen before that elliptic orbits for, the li for linear maps are stable because we just have rotations. However, uh, seeing what happens in the in the nonlinear case is extremely difficult. We cannot apply this Lyapunov argument, for instance. So a first result uh, was obtained by Siegel in 1942, and that was for particular maps, which are complex maps defined by nice functions like polynomials, like those you use for Mandelbrot sets. 
And he gave conditions under which, indeed, these points are stable. And then a more general theory for Hamiltonian systems, including billiards, was developed by Kolmogorov, Arnold, and Moser in the 1950s and, and 60s. So one consequence of this more general theory is the following result, saying that if I have an elliptic point and assume its eigenvalues are not cubic or quartic roots of one, and, okay, there's an additional uh, condition on some coefficient called a Birkhoff invariant, depending only on derivatives of the map up to order 3 at x star. If this constant is different from 0, then the point is stable. And this is, so it, it is a particular case of what is called Kolmogorov, Arnold, or Moser theory, or for brief KAM theory, which is also quite a complicated theory. So let me just give you one uh, idea of what this theory does. So remember, if I linearize my system, I, I have a rotation. And if I have a rotation, it means that I can t find some kind of polar coordinates. So theta r are polar coordinates, in which the linear map is given by theta n plus 1 is theta n plus some constant omega, which is a rotation number, and r n plus 1 is equal to r n. So that would be my rotation. But then due to the nonlinear terms, I get some additional terms here. And they have the form Rn times some function f of theta n Rn. And here I will have something of the form Rn squared times g of theta n Rn. So these are additional terms, but they are small if r is small. And what this Kolmogorov-Arnold theory says is that under certain conditions on omega, so omega has to be irrational and uh, far enough from uh, rational numbers, what is called Diophantine numbers, these maps have invariant curves. So there exist invariant curves. So it means that around my point I will have a certain will have certain curves which are close to circles but not quite circles and they will remain invariant so their interior will be invariant and therefore the point will be stable. And this condition with the Birkhoff invariant uses the fact that well if the rotation number when r increases uh, is not constant, it has to change a little bit, then you will always be able to find such invariant curves. So it kind of changes the value of omega a little bit as you move outwards. So you can apply this kolmogorov arnold moser theory. So uh, let me end with a particular example and some ideas of how this is related to uh, the title of my presentation. So instead of talking about billiards, I will talk about a simpler example with, which is called Chirikov's standard map. So it's again a map of dimension two. So it doesn't come from a billiard, but it also comes from a mechanical system which is called a, a kicked oscillator. So. Uh, so Q and P are like an angular variable and angular momentum. And it has the following form. So Qn plus 1 is Qn plus Pn plus 1. And Pn plus 1 is Pn minus epsilon, which is a parameter, times this function sine of 2 pi Qn. So you, you can check that. OK, obviously things are periodic in Q, but they are also periodic in P. So 
if you understand everything in uh, actually the square 0, 1 times 0, 1 or minus a half a half squared, uh, you understand what happens everywhere. And so uh, let me just find the fixed points of this map. So I want Pn plus 1 to be equal to Pn and Qn plus 1 to be equal to Qn. Now the condition on Q means that Pn plus 1 should be equal to 0 and therefore Pn should be equal to 0 and the condition on P then gives me that minus epsilon sinus of 2 pi qn should be 0. And so therefore there, there are two cases. So if epsilon is 0, all points of this type are fixed points. Okay, so all points of the form q0 are fixed. But if epsilon is positive, I have Q0 is a, is a fixed point if and only if sinus 2 pi Q is 0. And that means that Q is a multiple of pi. And actually, because everything is periodic, there are only two different uh, points, which are the point uh, Q equals 0 and the point Q equals, uh, yeah, sorry, that this Q uh, is not in Z because Q, uh, I have defined everything modulo pi. So, so actually, what is important here is Q is 0 and Q is 1 half. Now, you can check by computing the Jacobian matrix, uh, as I've told before, that Q equals 0 is elliptic and the other one is hyperbolic. And now we can look at uh, a few uh, simulations here. So. This is a very old uh, figure I made with orbits of, uh, of this map for increasing values of epsilon. So when epsilon equals zero, it is like for the billiard in the circle, uh, so P is constant and I, my orbits are horizontal curves, horizontal lines. Now, when, if you look at, at this top left figure here, so epsilon is 0 0.1, well, then you see, actually, I have my elliptic point here in the middle at 0, 0, and I have my hyperbolic point here. And you also see that there are, uh, the orbits seem to be belong to curves, but it's always hard to tell from the simulation. Actually, if you look at epsilon is 0 0.5, what you see is that, okay, indeed, I have my elliptic point, which is surrounded by curves that look a bit like ellipses. They are deformations of ellipses. But you also notice something here around the hyperbolic point, and, and these are actually chaotic orbits. And this is related to this mechanism of Smale's horseshoe. Now, when I increase again epsilon, now uh, you see I have more uh, chaos, so I have more chaotic orbits here. But you also see actually something fractal happening. Why is that? Well, because around my elliptic point here, I, again, I have these curves, these KAM curves. And I have a map, which is the map I've shown before, which is a perturbation of a rotation. And I, again, I have, you know, invariant curves, but I can also apply all these arguments I explained in uh, the previous talk about, you know, having uh, periodic orbits with different rotation numbers. And it means 
you can see it for instance on, on this figure for epsilon is 1.2 you, you see here actually a new orbit so it has appeared 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 so you see that there's an orbit an elliptic orbit of period 6 and a hyperbolic orbit of period 6 and between there are some chaotic orbits and I could do the same now for each of these elliptic islands of period 6 if I zoom in I will again find that they are surrounded by ellip so chains of elliptic and hyperbolic orbits and so on. So I have actually an infinite sequence of orbits around orbits around orbits that form a, a fractal uh, kind of fractal picture. All right that's all for today so thanks a lot for watching take care see you soon